And what is your name? Clara Sousa Silva. And um, Clara, are we alone in the universe? Maybe we are, maybe we're not. That's the best you can do? It's the best I can do without uh, perjuring myself. <laughs> perjuring yourself? Why would you need to <laughs> perjure yourself? We may not be alone in the universe, um, but if we are, that's okay. And if we're not, then it is kind of our uh, philosophical duty to figure that out. In the question, are we alone, what did you understand by the word we? I mean life. Life. Viruses? Yes. <laughs> so we, are we the viral and other life forms on Earth alone? I'm sure if you interviewed them, they would say as much. Okay. Uh, do you think the question, are we alone, is an important question? Yes, I do. Why? Well, philosophically, I think it's the crucial question. Uh, but I think pragmatically, I think um, figuring out in which way we're special and which way we're not uh, can only be a good thing. You think your parents or your grandparents would answer the same way? That yes, it's an important question, or well, my grandparents were in a war, so I think they had bigger things to bigger so fish to fry. War is, more <laughs> war is more important than the question: Are we not? I think it's a privilege to be sufficiently healthy and happy to question our existence in the universe. Um, I don't presume that everyone in the world and throughout history has been equally concerned with life out there. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat you had to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Well, I would personally spend it on figuring out every gas that every possible life form can make, figuring out what that gas would look like in every possible atmosphere, then point all our telescopes at as many atmospheres as possible until we found a biosphere that was a smoking gun for life. You wouldn't make another telescope so you could do this more easily? I believe in quantity over quality. Quantity over quality, okay, okay. Um, no SETI research? Of course. I don't, I don't think any of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, is uh, more special than the other. I think we should look everywhere. So, so you're going to invest what fraction of your money in SETI? Into radio. Very little. Right, what, 1%? Maybe less. How about microscopes? Would you buy any microscopes to look for nano aliens? No. No. That's too stupid an idea. It's too far away. Nano? Is in this room? To look for nano here? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm going to leave that for someone else. I, I think remote, det if you're focusing on life elsewhere, then um, remote detection is... Well, what if there are little alien spaceships in this room that we don't know about because they're so small? Well, I do think that is silly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> do you think we're inside of an alien? No. You know, like your neurons are inside your brain, but yes. they don't know that they're inside your brain, kind of like the Truman Show. He didn't Or know the Matrix. It. Yes, so you don't, you don't think that's a situation that we could be in? Quite possibly. I think it's uh, maybe a mathematical impossibility, but um, it's, it's, it could be. But you don't want to invest any of your hundred billion into no. investigating that? No. A hundred billion is not as much as you think it is if we are trying to investigate every planet orbiting every star in the galaxy. I won't have money to spare for SETI and nano aliens. You're limiting yourself to the galaxy. I thought you liked quantity. Yeah. And there are 300 billion stars in the galaxy. and uh, Many more outside. But noise is an inevitability. And our models are uh, inevitably flawed. And on top of that, our understanding of the underlying molecular gases is flawed. Combine all of these flaws, and we have lost so much that I'm not adding another one by looking at other galaxies. But what you describe to find aliens is what you do, mm -hmm. so you want to invest in yourself. Yes. Okay. Now... I think it's the biggest... It is selfish, of course, but I think our fundamental lack of understanding of molecular spectra is the biggest bottleneck in the in a inevitable discovery of life out there, and that's the bottleneck I want to fix. Okay, now let me... Do, 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 do. I think we'll end up looking at a, an alien biosphere and not know what we're looking at. And unless we can characterize that atmosphere, and to do that we need fundamental spectra, mm -hmm. it will be a waste of all the billions we've already spent in observations and training people. And so that is my focus. Trying to answer the question, are we alone, seems to be part of the trying to figure out how we fit into the universe. And this is like a big story, a scientific story of Genesis. Do, do you, would you agree with that? 
you know, of course, finding life out there will change the paradigm of who we are as people, but I think I'll leave that for the theologians. Although, I did think about what you were saying yesterday, that um, there must be life out there because otherwise we're special and any theory that ends and begins with us being special is flawed. You made the comparison that if you had never left the country, you would expect everyone else to speak English. And if you met someone from a different country and expected that, you would be wrong. And that's actually quite uh, uh, an absence of humility. I think that's a false equivalency. The equivalent would be, because everyone in my country farts, I'm going to expect other people in other countries to fart. Mm -hmm. And if I did that, I would actually be correct. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to do with Alien Life. So you're, you're more comfortable with humble farters rather than... Exactly. Uh, if I presume that all life farts, I think I could be right. Well, but you're... Do not, so use, that. Do not use that. Right. So we're asking you the question whether, <laughs> whether life is equivalent to farting or life is equivalent to uh, mores and, and uh, customs. Mm -hmm. And you think it's more equivalent to farting than it is exactly. to culture. Exactly. Okay, so... So anyway, this scientific story that we're putting together of how we got started, you know, Big Bang, Origin of the Earth, Origin of Life, is that something that's important, do you think, to you? Of course. You think it's important to everybody? To some extent, yes. Really? I, most of my friends don't care. I mean, most of your friends don't care about most things in the world, but mm -hmm. there's a common thread throughout civilization, in fact, all civilizations, to worry to some extent about where they came from and where they're going. So it's not unthinkable to think that it's pervasive for a reason. My dog doesn't worry about this. I said civilizations, but yes, you think, I don't think all life needs to worry about it, but I think humanity has always worried about it. So, a hundred thousand years ago, I'm, I'm, let's see, I'm chasing down a gazelle or something, and I'm trying to get a, a root that I want to eat, and I see gods everywhere around me, I know that there are life everywhere in the universe because I see it. I see my ancestors in the sky. Does that mean I'm wondering? About, I'm not wondering about are we alone? I know we're not alone. You're wondering what's out there. And no, I know what's out there. There's my grandfather over there. There's my the the founder of our tribe is over here in these skies. So, you know, there's the moon which I love because it gives me light. You know, that doesn't seem to correspond with asking a question: Are we alone? I think the equivalent in that story would be wondering if they're beyond the river, people who live there would also um, be wondering the same thing. That would be the equivalent of not being alone. Yes, because the they don't want to be killed, though. That's very practical. Go a little further. So they're far enough that they're not competing for land. I think people have wondered if there are people beyond the land that they know yes, yes. forever. And the land that they knew used to be very limited, and now the land that we know is the whole universe. And so people have just been changing the scale. But I would have thought, well, with we, some free time, even a, a wandering caveman. Some free time, okay. Once the gazelle's caught and the fire's made. Okay. Um, <laughs> we've been talking about life elsewhere. What about intelligent life elsewhere? Life that has you know, human-like intelligence? That I wouldn't dare to pronounce myself on. On Earth, there's been billions of species and one capable of technological communication. The odds are bad even just by the numbers on Earth. So that seems particularly unlikely. So you think there's life out there, but not, not probably not human-like intelligent life? No, but I, again, there's only one data point. Unlike the rest of life, where I feel like there's a lot of data points. Well, there's more than one data point. For example, there's the absence of radio signals. That's kind of like, hey, you have a solution to Fermi's paradox by saying, hey, the no, human intelligence is not easy to evolve, as in we see here. Of course, but a negative being a data point is... I'm okay with that. I'm okay-ish with that. Enough yeah. to say that that reinforces the idea that this Haven't technology heard, is not inevitable. Haven't you heard about blazing saddles? No, blazing something. A Sherlock Holmes story in which the dog didn't bark at night. And because the dog didn't bark, they knew that the criminal was it's somebody who's familiar with the dog. So that's the... I thought that was... Yeah. I'm not saying the negative is uh, not a point of information, but... Both with the negative and without it, we have one data point, so it doesn't seem particularly likely. So intelligent life is certainly not out where I will put my money on. But Carl Sagan would disagree with you. I think he thought that there are many ways to become functionally equivalent humans. So you would disagree with him on that? Yes. Okay. Have you ever seen a UFO? No. But I did work in an observatory in New Zealand where we did get a lot of phone calls from people who did. 
You've never seen an object that was in the sky that you couldn't identify? I, there was an object I couldn't identify, but I knew others could. There was none that I thought no one would. I see. None that came from an extraterrestrial civilization. No. You ever been abducted by aliens? No. Okay. Not that I know of. <laughs> Do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? I don't believe it's truly a paradox. Because? Um, because there is no necessary controversy. There's a lot of points we don't know. But yes, if we were, if we're not special, then there should be more. And given that there seems like there isn't, that is a paradox, but it's a pretty flimsy one. Well, it seems to me that you can easily have life elsewhere, but as you said earlier, you don't think it could be human-like intelligence, and that therefore you have a solution. Oh, no, it's not that I don't think, it just doesn't seem like it, and I wouldn't dare to pronounce on it given there's only one data point on Earth. Mm. Different. Um, solution to the Fermi paradox is that either it, uh, solution to the Fermi paradox is the same as the solution to Dirac equation. It's likely extremely rare and there's a finite number of stars in the galaxy, so the fact there's a large number doesn't help very much. On Earth, there's trillions of species that have existed, and one can communicate across galaxies and can do it very poorly. So it's not that crazy, even just using normal Drake equation numbers, to only get one for the size of the galaxy. Do you have a favorite uh, alien movie? Contact. So in the movie Contact, the character several times they say do you think we're alone and the answer comes back well if we are it's an awful waste of space what do you think of that i think it's wonderful and true just not necessarily uh, accompanied by other intelligent species but, but you think it's a waste of space if there's no life elsewhere do you really believe that actually i do why would it be a waste of space if there are no human beings no, I don't mean human. I mean, mean some life. Okay, if there's no life, you think it's a like the moon is a waste of space? No, I don't think every individual planet without life is a waste of space. I think if we're the only planet that hosts life, that seems awfully sad considering otherwise. Sad. Yes. Does that mean waste? Yes. Sad. If there's no life elsewhere in the universe, you think it's sad and a waste of space? A waste of space in the sense that it's, I think, a... Metaphysical tragedy. <laughs> a metaphysical tragedy. Okay, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Oh. Do you have any favorite aliens? What kind would you like? Fun uh, this is an emotional fungi. question. Fungi. Fungi. You'd like to find fungi. I would love to find fungi. Okay. A widespread um, alien species that relies on cooperation and networking to have complex emergent behavior. That would be cool. And then, so, okay, so you like, you, do you like uh, terrestrial fungi? Yes, and, and farms and, and, and birds and all species that rely on cooperation for clever things. Do you think, co you know, there's a, in the debate in biology between cooperation and, co and uh, competition. Yes. And often it's the male biologists who concentrate on the competition, the females who say, oh, cooperation is more important. So I, I see this dichotomy. So do, you, <laughs> so do you think that both men and women are right, or do you think women are right about this? I in terms both, of aliens? Oh. I think both men and women are right. I think both on li life on Earth has already shown extremely complexity both in in and out group altruism and competitiveness. And these are pressures that can coexist and have done so for most biological communities on Earth throughout the history of the Earth. So I don't see why the two processes, the price equation works. The price equation, okay, we haven't talked about that yet. Um, Based on what we know about the evolution of life on Earth, some astrobiologists say, you know what, we need to find things that have evolved twice independently on Earth, and that becomes a better candidate for what we should expect elsewhere. Do you buy that logic? Well, I think it's very persuasive, and that things that only happen once will, statistically speaking, be harder to replicate than things that happen a thousand times, yes, and independently. But do you think the word independent, can it all be applied to life on Earth when it also has a common ancestor? None of it's independent from each other. Not truly independent, but things. this doesn't need to be a dichotomy. It can be a sliding scale. Of given a certain environment, some things will always develop. For example, I like to think that although Earth is very reliant on a night-day system that rotates, uh, a tidally locked planet isn't impossible to host life. 
or a planet around a star with extreme UV radiation is not completely lost to the possibilities of life. And in those cases, I would expect if life existed on a planet that is uh, receiving a lot of UV radiation, for example, that they would evolve multiple ways of sheltering themselves from UV radiation. And those would be considered independent as much as the independent evolutions on Earth have been. I would like to think that there are many ways to um, skin a cat. Mm. There has to be a better expression than Mel that. <laughs> Melanocyte the cat. Yeah. <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke once said that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology will be, indi will be indistinguishable from magic. But there's a guy, Canadian, Carl Schroeder, said, uh, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced uh, technology will be indistinguishable from nature. So the idea being that when you get really sophisticated technology, you're more sustainable and you don't cut down land, you know, forests and you don't have high population. You create a truly efficient system with your environment. Yes, and you're much more, I don't know, you're friendly and cooperative with nature rather than domineering over it. Would you agree with that? No, not from what we have at least experienced on Earth. Evolution seems to lead to a lot of waste and require a lot of energy. And the more complex we become, uh, certainly as humans, the more energy we use, and eventually we will run out of resources here and expand outwards, and so we'll be very easily distinguishable from nature. But isn't that a problem based on the uh, number of is population, over, overpopulation? Overpopulation technology in our case. Our okay. supercomputers need more energy than we can make as biological beings. Do you think if we see aliens, we'll recognize them? As? As aliens? You As think? life, you mean? Yeah. Could there, well, for example, you didn't like my nano alien example, and that was a, trying to create. I didn't like a nano alien example, not because I don't think they could be nano aliens. I just think that if aliens were sufficiently advanced to become, to be able to be around us in their nano form, they would have announced themselves in some way. Announce themselves? I don't mean as a. Have you announced a voice yourselves to your amoebas on crawling between your fingers? But I. I didn't come and visit my amoebas. Are you saying the nano aliens were always here? Because then they're not aliens. They're even closer. I've been living on you all your life and you've never greeted them. But I didn't see them remotely decide to come over right, and yeah. fly over to interact with the mm -hmm. amoebas. At that point, yes, I think the amoebas would have noticed me. <laughs> if I appeared uh, at once rather than having co-evolved with them. Okay, so let me ask you the question again. Are we alone in the universe? No. And why do you believe that? Because any theory that begins and ends with we are special is uh, ultimately flawed. Some, some particularly astronomers, say uh, we're not alone. And I ask them why, and he said, they say, well, because there's so many, so many Earths, an infinite amount of Earths, or a very, very large number of Earths. But then you have to think, wait a minute, the probability of having life elsewhere is how many potential sites there are, how many Earths, but also times the probability of life emerging. And most people just ignore that and just pretend it's either one or large enough so it won't be swamped or won't swamp the large number of Earths. So, and that's the assumption you're comfortable with. I'm comfortable that given enough uh, good places for life, uh, life is inevitable on some of them. I don't know the numbers, but I'm confident that the number is not zero. And by life, you don't mean just an RNA world filled with viruses, but you mean cellular life? I mean, well, or equivalent complexity. I don't presume that with the, I don't presume with the variety of chemical space that could be starting points. I don't presume to say that the cell as we know it is the only form, but some form of containment would make sense. Yes. But you use the word complexity, and that's a kind of a, a problematic word in the sense that some people think that, oh, we can characterize biological evolution on Earth by an increase in complexity, and other people say, what do you mean by complexity? And uh, other people say, oh, eukaryotes, multicellular eukaryotes are more complex. But then other people say, wait a minute, that's morphological complexity. Bacteria have chemical complexity, but not morphological complexity. So when you use the word complexity, what did you mean? I mean uh, secondary metabolites, for example. Second, what? So a, a system that doesn't just take uh, nutrients from the environment and produce waste, but then is within a network where that waste itself is used up and a secondary waste is produced. I would say that's a more complex system than... But not as complex as a tertiary system? You want to put lots of... I don't know where I would stop it, but I, I, if I, I want to keep the, my definition as simple as possible so I can detect these things uh, remotely, and that would be how I would measure So an ecosystem of bacteria in a forest is more complex than you? That does fail you right. 
it's something more complex than the things that came before it. Okay. I suppose a complexity of a biosphere would be measured by the, the uh, interacting metabolites between all these um, life forms. The and size so, of the network? Or something. So the size, the network, the, uh, the number of metabolites in the network could be a, a marker for complexity. Okay, and you, I asked you what your favorite alien was, and you said you're going to stick with the fungus? Yes, I'm going to stick with the fungus. Can you close your eyes and <laughs> think of aliens, and then you come up with anything else? You have to close your eyes. I'm trying to get to with your emotional side, not your rational side. Here. Okay. Okay, so close your eyes, and then so think alien. What kind would you like to find? I mean, if I really, if I could just have anything I want, I would like to have an alien that was able to both walk, swim, and fly. Walk, swim, and fly. <laughs> so you could ride on its back or something, like Harry Potter or something? No, it could be... A uh, dragon? It could be uh, uh, the sort of similar to a fish that can glide with uh -huh. feet so that there will be no planet where I can't imagine it could live. It couldn't live. Aerobic respiration? Not necessarily. That would ruin my phosphine um, <laughs> premise. <laughs> Harry dragon? Is that what it is? Yeah. I took that slide out, but actually phosphine has been proposed as a way of explaining dragons because it's highly flammable and biogenically produced. So although it's presumably humorous, it's completely chemically sound. Okay. Okay. Now, this... this uh, By Gassman I'm... and Glinman in 1993, so this is mine. <coughs> this MOOC I'm making is for students who are interested in astrobiology. Do you have any advice for them? Even if you find nothing, most of the tools that astrobiologists need, and in my case, um, quantum astrochemists need, are uh, about finding molecules anywhere. And although I'm doing it to find molecules associated with an alien biosphere, in the meantime, molecules behave the same no matter where in the universe they are. So my work can be used to find forest fires and improve combustion engines. And so, like most fields in astrobiology, because it's multidisciplinary, in the meantime, while you're trying to figure out if there's alien life out there, which is the biggest question, you can solve so many of the little questions here. Presumably you've talked to the public or your parents or friends about this question occasionally. And uh, it, when you have, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that students in particular have about this question, are we alone? That all life um, on an alien planet must be intelligent, and those are the only rules we can find. And that likewise, if humans just stop sending out radio signals into the universe, that somehow we would never be discovered by an alien civilization. That all signals are technological. That's the biggest misconception. Our whole biosphere is a giant planet-sized signal we sent out into the universe, saying we're here, we have complex life cycles, we die and we pollute, and we have forests and oceans and billions of species.